Hey, what's up? I'm Mike Squires. This is Mr. Big. Welcome to Couchless Podcast, episode number 187. My guest, Ian Fowles of Aquabats and many other fine rock and roll outfits. Ian is a super talented, smart, funny guy. I had a great time speaking with him. Um, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I feel like I could have talked to him for a full week as a full-time job about a lot of stuff. Some stuff caught me off guard out of the gate. And um, I kept kind of kept uh, coming back around to it. And so um, sorry we didn't talk more rock and roll. But my interest was piqued. And, you know, if you've listened to the show, we we go down some rabbit holes for sure. We go down some rabbit holes. We like the rabbit holes. So... Uh, this one, there's some rabbit holes. There's some sidestepping. That's what we do. All right. Listen, uh, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting at uh, patreon.com slash couchers. There's a bunch of really, 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 really cool videos coming. Performance videos. There's some very cool guests coming. Um, and I'm really excited. And your support there at Patreon um, really helps. Thank you for, to everyone who's already supporting and pledging over there. Um, yeah, it's what makes this happen because I could not actually afford to continue doing it like I have been doing it without it. So thank you. Um, let's see what else I got new t-shirts. Check this out. Huh? You like that? Poof. That's sweet. Uh, I'll have those up on in the merch store by the time this goes up. I'll put them up tomorrow. Um, you can order those if you want to support. Uh, you can also there's a there's a donation button in the Instagram thing if you don't want to pledge uh, Patreon support and you just want to like toss a couple bucks at the show because you see something you like. There's a there's a way to do that there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. What else? Thank you to Variety Coffee Roasters, varietycoffeeroasters.com, at Variety Coffee on the uh, social media. Uh, I drink coffee uh, every day, all day. I drink Variety Coffee every day. I use it at work. Um, and Variety Coffee is the only place where you can get a Couch Riffs coffee mug. How you do that is you go over there, you go to their uh, merch section and um you can buy a mug for ten dollars easy peasy or you can uh add it to your cart add two boxes of coffee they their uh their bags of coffee are very stylistically packaged in boxes that look like cartons of smokes which is great so add two boxes of coffee to your order uh at checkout code couch riffs and you get your mug for free free look at that that's it's fucking sweet thank you variety coffee there's also a great subscription service there check it out um there's a there's a whole click through process so it helps uh guide you to uh the coffee that best suits your needs they they ask you a number of questions and get you to where you need to be so that's uh that's great and you can get that weekly bi-weekly or monthly Pretty sweet. Thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. Love you guys. Thank you to Marvin Guitars for uh, indulging me and and co-designing the CN90 with me. I recently put a new Wolf Tone humbucker in there for next year's touring, if next year's touring still happens. Uh, I needed to get something a little beefier in there. Love the P90, but the um, the humbucker is going to have to do. So thanks also to Wolf Tone. Um, you can buy that guitar at. River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington, or The Guitar Shop, New York City, in Brooklyn. Um, if you're in uh, the area, you can go check those out or check out their websites. Uh, let's see. We're going to jump into this episode, man. These things, sometimes these things drag on. I don't want, I never want them to, but sometimes they do. So, here we go. Uh, don't forget the golden rule. Just treat people the way you want to be treated. It's not that hard to not be an asshole. 
Nobody wants to be treated like an asshole. I want, oh, do you have a? Uh, do you have your camera locked? Your perspective yeah. locked? I did. Let's see. Yeah. That fixes it. Hopefully. You know what? All's well. Um. How you doing? This sounds better. I think. I think it does. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm wondering now, since I'm totally mobile, if I should just go out in my car or something. If they're... You know what? Can you hear the drums in the background? I mean, <laughs> it's not going to be that big of a deal, I don't think. Okay. Okay. I just heard a little bit of a rat-a-tat-tat. But you know what? Yeah. Vibe. We're, we're getting, we're rock and roll vibing. Yeah. <laughs> in its raw form. Um, How's it going, man? It's good. It's good, man. I'm just crazy busy. I have three little kids, and so they like three kids under five, and they just tear up the house all morning. And I take care of them while my wife works, and then uh -huh. at like three o'clock, we high five. I go teach guitar lessons till like eight or nine, and then I come back and I just started a teaching credential program. So I'm doing school like late night. So I'm just like. No rest for the wicked right now. So you are do you're teaching lessons and then after that you're taking a class to be a certified like to go be a yeah. high, like a school teacher? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W uh, on what subject? Uh social science, social studies, history basically. Amazing. So just What's crazy your... busy right now, so I apologize trying, you know, Oh, dude, it's fine. Trying, you you have a work crazy out of schedule, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, w let me ask you this. A, very, a totally un-rock and roll question. Do you have a favorite um, era of history to study? Do you have a like a specialty? Well, um, so here's the roundabout story is that I'm, I'm almost done with my PhD in religious studies. I'm like, I'm halfway through the dissertation. I'm like, which is like the final phase. And then I just realized basically we love California where we grew up and to get jobs as like a college professor, you just have to take them anywhere in your like minute field, wherever right. they pop up in the country kind of thing. And we, we want to stay here basically and uh, close to family and stuff. And, and we love it here. So it's like, okay, well, I can finish that kind of anytime. We'll put that on the side. My wife's a teacher and- um, What does she teach? She teaches history as well, actually, high school, but she teaches uh, online. And she's like, if you just taught at this online school with me, we'd have both have summers off and we'd both be done at four and it would be amazing. I'm like, you're right, let's do it. <laughs> Then you can't switch off with the daycare, though. Right. But cross that bridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have so many questions right now. None of them rock and roll related. Uh, A, you sort of breezed right over um, uh, PhD in religious studies. That is a that's a lot of work. And yeah, absolutely. That is a, that's a, that's a pretty heavy dedication to a subject. Yeah. yeah Coming from a guy who has like two quarters of community college. <laughs> it's no, it's not something I like planned on early in life. It just kind of happened as I went along kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I was one of those kids like school kind of came easy to me kind of thing in a way. And, and I enjoyed it and I love reading and all this stuff. And then also for a while, it was like actually a decent thing while I was in a band to like be in school. Cause like, you know, you mainly tour in the summers most of the time. And sure, it was, it was something I could juggle with being in a band. Um, so uh, I was able to kind of do that for a long time. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, having, where I'm at in the PhD right now, like, I don't know if I would have, I don't know. 
you gone want... back in time and told myself like maybe don't start the phd i i don't know <laughs> so you you don't intend to finish no i do yeah i do because I'm, I'm so okay. close but um but this uh, i'm probably going to get this teaching credential first which takes about a year so well there i mean god there's a there's a lot to cover here there there's a lot of crossover um in history and and religious studies for sure yeah um how, how so how did you land on history after you were after you decided well it's probably the closest it's like the closest thing to they have in high school to religious studies um so uh you know i did my my bachelor's in american studies and religious studies double major and then i did a master's in cultural studies and then phd in religious studies um because i'm fat i'm fascinated with like people and what they believe and why they believe it what not just like the beliefs of different religions but like what makes something a religion uh and um I, I love all the weird stuff out there because religion is weird there's a lot of it let's not let's not let's not be you know <laughs> pretend that it's not it's weird and uh, everyone's got their own little weirdness that, that that they were raised with or that they got into and and i and i find it's it's fascinating um what people believe and you know going beyond just normal kind of big big few religions like the beliefs trail off into the paranormal right and it gets it deals with life after death and the, and uh you know all kind even bring in ufos and and what is god and you know where we are in the cosmos like the, it's related to so many other realms in religious studies you know it's the ultimate questions and and big ideas and uh stuff people will die over you know um uh, so, million. I find, uh, I find it kind of have. fascinating. Uh, no, it really is. You know, I went. Um, yeah, you are L uh, LDS. Are you practice? Do you still practice? Yes. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was. I was baptized uh, as a young child. Uh huh. Um, and it's and the circumstances were pretty sketchy because uh Just my some missionaries knock on your door and well yeah yeah and you know my my mom was a bit of a, a grifter okay and, and she saw a pretty good opportunity uh because that church uh has an incredible uh serve like infrastructure of services for members absolutely yeah. and uh my, my my mom really exploited that um <laughs> but uh yeah i have in i have uh, in-laws also in in uh in utah who are lds yeah so do you guys go to church and stuff too for a little while and we did i was a part of the cub scouts there in pleasant hill yeah, california yeah. And, okay. uh, at the church yeah I I have uh that that's like Bay Area? Yeah. 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 Cool. Um Yeah. Do you, <laughs> I, have so yeah, much, I, I don't know where to go this, from there. There's <laughs> I have so much stuff to ask you. Um yeah, uh, you know, yeah, definitely religion is weird. Definitely in yeah. in my early 20s when I left home and was ain't mad about a lot about stuff i went yeah. through times when i was like man religions are terrible they're bad and then uh oddly enough a music ad, an ad for a band opened my eyes and the ad said it was a, a pretty prominent seattle band and uh, at the time like they're you know they're a big club draw and it said uh uh looking for bass player uh please don't be so open-minded that you hate christians and uh it f just felt like a it felt like a slap 
in the face. I was like, oh, I'm an asshole. Like how, uh, I'm an asshole. But, you know, I've done enough psychedelic drugs in my life, not in a long time, to know that uh, I'm not smart enough or articulate enough to, art, you know, to de define what God is. To, it's yeah. a pretty huge thing. Yeah. Uh, and many uh, eloquent philosophers have have been able to in ways that have communicated to a population of an entire planet in various ways. Right. Yeah, it seems like every culture has their spokespeople they connect with, right? So, but what I, I mean, what I did being raised Mormon, um, and in a religious home and everything and uh and then got really into playing in bands and that in the scene and like and just music and i loved it so much i started to see just tons of parallels um between rock and roll and religion and so i ended up writing my master's thesis on it and and just turned it into a book i published it myself put out a book and it's it's all about like how, how trying to prove rock and roll itself is a religion. You can look at it as a religion. It, was it accepted? I mean, that's a little bit weird, maybe for the church to accept. Would, would, like, did anyone look at it and say, uh, "Hey, you're playing with fire"? I didn't. I didn't write it for the church. I wrote it for my school. <laughs> right, but did any? Yeah. Did, surely, word got around. Maybe, uh, I don't, like, I don't, I don't know. you know, it's more, it was more like an academic exercise, you know, right. um, it's, you know, can you prove to the satisfaction of your committee that, uh, you know, you, this uh, is possible. So um, it's one of those things where you take, you know, you take, you look at other uh, theorists or philosophers or whoever, and, and kind of show like this thing called rock and roll can fit their ideas of the sacred as much as Christianity or Judaism or whatever. Right. It uh, functions in the same way, you know, the, the club is, is the church of the temple, the music is the scriptures, the, um, the rock stars are kind of the deities and so on and so on and so on. They, there's, ritual community of of believers and um there's ritual actions like you know there's a lot of taxation there's so there's so much <laughs> that just is, you can look at right right <laughs> there's a lot of taxation in rock and roll sure <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> uh this uh this yeah, is i don't know if anyone at the church even knew i wrote it or right or anything, do you, you know, still or, have or, copies I have like two left, maybe. I stopped publish, repub, reprinting it. I was just doing it myself and, and sending through like, I was like a vendor on Amazon and then it got to be just kind of a pain because I wasn't, right. wasn't really a money-making thing. I was selling them for 10 bucks and I would maybe make three off it. Right. If, you know, but it was like, it was kind of a pain and I had repressed it like four times and I was like, uh, maybe I'll just let it die and then... Do I'm a second look. edition sometime, and, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> check out friends. check out Powell's website for a used copy. I might have one in my garage. I can dig up for you. If you've only <laughs> got two, I don't want to. Uh, I'll give you fifteen for I, it. Well, I mean, I can repress it at any time. You know, maybe I will. I don't know. But it was like ten years ago I put it out, or eleven years ago. Um, That's crazy. So yeah. when did you start, did, was there music in your home growing up and, um, yeah, when did absolutely. you start playing? That's, I mean, yeah, absolutely. That's what got me into music. My dad had a great record collection and would play music for us all the time as kids, you know, it was Beatles and Zeppelin and the cars and the doors and different stuff. And I just loved it all, you know? Huey Lewis in the news, you know. Your dad whatever. was into the cars? That's killer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of like a classic rock guy. And, um, you know, Beatles and 
stones and different stuff but and he would just play it all and we'd all dance me and my sister would dance around I, it's, I think that's where I just grew to love it and I'd just grab a tennis racket or whatever and pretend like I'm playing a guitar and right. then I saw the movie Back to the Future and I'm like yeah I want to do that and I didn't I didn't realize at the time like oh he's just you know doing Chuck Berry moves and ACDC like I didn't know I was just a you know six or seven years old or something and i was like oh that's awesome i didn't have any older siblings to kind of show me the way or you know it was, it was the 80s it's not like you could go online and look at all the all the performances or anything like i would catch mtv here and there you know um but my dad was more of like a vh1 guy you know so you're getting like uh there was a real line in the sand back then <laughs> yeah he's getting the more adult contemporary you know Billy Ocean. Or uh, what is it, you know, Phil Collins and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, as he matured, he got into more of that stuff. But but I, I kind of loved it all. And I tried playing, you know, musical instruments in elementary school and stuff. And it, I did like the cello and the clarinet and neither, neither of those stuck. I always wanted to play the guitar. And finally, my grandma bought me a guitar when I was like 12 or 13. And uh, my mom, it was funny, we were at the gas station. There was just like this this van with guitar lessons written on the side. And my mom's like, let's go talk to that guy. And, you know, this guy in the van and get you some guitar <laughs> lessons. Like, no, no, mom, don't. let No. And she just went over and talked to this guy. And he'd come to my house and I like, took a few guitar lessons. And and I, it was over, man. Once I got the guitar, I would sleep with it. I would eat with it. I'd go to the bathroom with it. It wouldn't leave my side. You know, I was hooked. So... What were the what were the first things that you learned and and the first sort of the bands that inspired you to play that were not your dad's bands? <laughs> um, it was it was kind of it was heavy metal at first for me. It's yeah. that, it was, at that time it was like around uh, you know what is that probably like ninety ninety one ninety two or something. I started playing, and so it was all the big MTV bands. It was Metallica and it was. Black Sabbath and uh, Ozzy. Ozzy was a big one. Randy Rhodes for sure. And um, he had Guns the live album out at the time. Yeah, Guns and Roses. Um, no More Tears came out right about then too. Slave to the Grind came out right then. The Skid Row yeah. album was vicious. Yeah, I, I loved all that and like grunge. I was like, kind of came along right right around that time too. But I was really into metal more. Right. And then as a guitar player, just because I was like, wow, look at these guitar players. They're so amazing. And then I got kind of got into grunge. I didn't get into punk really till high school. And that and then it was all over for me in that way. I was like, oh, yeah, this is this is it. So but I started out kind of like a metal metal kid, metalhead. And then junior high and kind of morphed into a punker in high school, I guess. So uh, when did you have your first band? I was like 13 or 14 we like I was like seventh grade or something and we we played like a talent show you know it was just me and a drummer we played you know half of crazy train or something and then we played like maybe our eighth grade like um like end of the year play day or whatever you know they set up like a PA for us and, and we did me and a drummer and a bass player and no one really sang like we were all kind of too scared to sing right we were just doing like covers of Sabbath and Ozzy songs basically and Metallica songs and I'm kind of looking back I'm like I'm, I'm kind of stoked that like they let us do that <laughs> do you have any video footage or or audio recordings of that stuff I have a video of of that talent show of just me and a drummer playing crazy train I have a video VHS tape of it somewhere when was the I last time you watched it I don't know I haven't I had, haven't digitized it uh, and then I have a couple photos of playing that like eighth grade play day or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was like, let's do this from the day one. I forced my buddy to learn drums. Um, like, look, this guy, I have this guitar teacher. He comes to my house. He also teaches drums. He'll teach you. I kind of, you just kind of forced my friends to start a band with me, you know? And then when he got into high school, I was like, oh, wow. Oh, there's other kids who you don't have to force. And they actually are really into this. And OK, I'll start a band bands with them, too. You know, so. Um, and then in high school, it just kind of it was crazy. And I feel just kind of lucky from probably where I where I lived. 
but like in high school i had bands and we were like opening for touring bands at local venues you know right and i was a teenager um and we were putting out our own demo tapes and seven inches and stuff because we just got into this scene and they didn't care if you were, re were really young um and it was kind of awesome it's you know orange county california in the 90s and and uh you know just not that long after every punk band had come out of there social distortion the adolescence agent orange like the list goes on you know they that they, they were all out of fullerton which i was just like the next town over from fullerton and um and so and you know Fuller, Fender guitars in Fullerton. There was just some, you know, it was in the rock and roll was in the water around there. And, um, but it was kind of crazy. The high school I went to, there's like a decent amount of us who ended up being in like touring professional bands. Really? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, we started this, I started this band Death by Stereo, um, this hardcore band. And our first show was at our high school uh esperanza high school in, in anaheim and um our drummer was still in high school when we started it and and uh his name is jared alexander and he's gone on to play in every hardcore band and now he plays for my chemical romance and um he's been in tons of touring bands alkaline trio and played on tons of records and you know other guys in my band's in that band gone on to do other stuff but there was guys a couple years younger than us that were started this band called atreyu which is like kind of a metalcore right and has gotten really big and then one of my good friends we used to we play coffee shops now he's in a band called the cold war kids it's like big indie band kind of coachella There's something in the, in the water there it was all within this span of a few years a ton of a ton of like musicians came out of my high school and I was like wow and looking back like I guess that's not normal probably no uh, I think there's a high number of people from my high school class that maybe went to jail <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did you grow up in northern California or did you kind of bounce around I was born there but I I, I grew up in Washington okay yeah north of Seattle okay cool uh, let me ask you this you you play fenders yeah was that do you think that was because of your proximity to fullerton and and the sort of heritage of a fender there or were you just sort of attracted to that guitar shape um at first i i mean my first guitar amp was a fender and like you know i got a strat it was maybe my my second electric guitar but really, when I first started, I wanted to do the Les Paul through the Marshall all the way, you right. know? And so I played I played Gibson and Marshall for a long time, actually. Always having a Fender kind of, you know, in the closet to mess around with and stuff. And it really wasn't until I joined the Aquabats that I really fully embraced all Fender kind of thing, you know? Right. It's because that band it really calls for it. You can't. You need some of that surfy twang, so um, you need to have a, a Fender when you're playing in the Aquabats, and um, it just, I got, you know, I think it's something that happens, it's an evolution with every player, like they they get into certain gear for a long time, and then like, well, I'm going to start exploring other stuff, and it's like, oh, yeah, I love this, and it's not like I don't like Les Pauls and Marshalls anymore, I've just, I've just gravitated towards Fenders more and more as I've gotten older, and the like range of sounds you can get out of them and me being left-handed it, it there was really a shortage of guitars for me to to play with and fender actually is some of, makes uh, some of the most left-handed guitars out there and they don't charge extra for them when i bought my first les paul i had to pay extra for it because it was left-handed um and but being left-handed right. then i, I also kind of got more into amps well, they have to like find guitar. maple tops with um, reverse flames. <laughs> the left-handed models. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, no I've, I did the thing where I've I've flipped guitars upside down and and I've kind of converted. I had a flying V. I converted to a left-handed one. But that's pretty sweet. You kind of get over that stuff as a left-handed player, and 
it's just I just want a left by a left hand a guitar that I can use, you know. I um, think that's fair. So <laughs> hey, let yeah, me ask you this bump, bumping knobs and stuff and like moving strap buttons and yeah. I want to figure out a timeline here. When did you start your academic studies? I started, um, I guess my freshman year at Cal State Fullerton was in like 97. But then, you know, bump, lots, of, lots of things chopped it up along the way to the PhD, you know. So I served a two-year mission for my church. Uh, oh, wow. Where did you go? So I went to Ohio. Where at? Uh, Central Ohio, like Columbus, Dayton huh? area. You kind of move you around. Around. It was like kind of the whole middle part of the state. Um, you know, I had friends going to Japan and, you know, Russia and all these crazy places. Like, you're going to Ohio. It's like, okay, whatever. Um, but no, it was, a, it was a crazy, it was a cr literally a crazy experience. Um, and I learned a ton. Um, and I'm really grateful for it. Um, it's, one of, it's one of those things where you're 19, it helps you kind of kind of grow up really fast and, and and really realize a lot of different things about the real world that I think most 19 year olds don't really learn until much later you know well you meet so, a lot of people you do you meet a lot of people you're thrown into a lot of awkward situations um and you just kind of um yeah by by meeting people learning kind of what 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 real life is like out there when you're you know that age you haven't lived much life you haven't been many places um and that kind of like it snaps you out of it and kind of wakes you up a lot but Ohio so like, is decidedly ahead. different than southern california absolutely yeah absolutely <laughs> and um yeah, I mean, I, I learned a ton. I, I, you know, I don't know how much you want to know about that, but um, you, you spend your whole time serving other people as well. So there's something you need to learn stuff about yourself, too, um, when you're out there. But uh, there's like maybe no other time in your life where you're just going to focus on kind of serving God and serving other people like that. It's, you're really focused. There's you don't you don't even call home you know, except like once or twice a year. And, and you just, you don't go to movies. You don't call your friends. You're just out to do this thing, you know, and, um, concentrating so, yeah. the energy. Yeah. And then, you know, then I come home and I got back, back into, uh, school and, um, did you have a guitar to... in Ohio or was that two years where you were not playing? I had it, I had it a little like here and there. Yeah. It depended, depended on who, like kind of the rules, like, oh, sure. Guitars are okay. No, no, no guitars. Um, but it's not like I'd had much time to play it. I'd fiddle around with it here and there. Did when you I got home, any homes that had guitars? Yeah, sometimes, but I'm, again, I'm left-handed. So, uh. but I mean, every left-handed player learns how to play it right-handed upside down. So, you know, I, I could get by, strum, strum some chords, do some something upside down, but you know, right. not not. I don't sound as good as I do left-handed. <laughs> but um, you know, I got home and I was so stoked. I had time and I was like, okay, I can play again. I was playing hours and hours a day, and then acquired tendonitis. <laughs> oh my god! I, I was literally just playing so much that it like burnt my wrist out and. So that'll flare up every now and again, but um, it was such a bummer to me. I started getting these like, um, like these little nodes in my wrist. Like, Can you feel like, them? They were like calcium. They were like, yeah, like a little marble, like right in my wrist here, like a calcium buildup. And stuff. Modern primitive. I don't, I'm like, what are these little lumps? I go to the doctor like, oh, yes. Yeah, you're probably from overuse. You need to calm down. It's like, I can't. I love playing guitar so much. <laughs> Wow. Um, so, you know, I used to play like down low, like Johnny Ramone, because I wanted to be Johnny Ramone. And he's like, you got to raise your guitar up because it's just that, ang that, ang that angle is killing you. 
you know, right. you gotta move it up a little. So I used to play my guitar down very low also. And, uh, the funny thing is I grew a patch of hair right here on my arm that did not exist before. It's still there, but it, it gets hardier when I'm touring from it hitting the edge of the guitar body. I know it sounds crazy. No, it's, but that's, <laughs> it's real. But, well, yeah, guitar, I mean, guitar playing messes up your body in a lot of ways. Like I played Les Pauls for a lot of years. I went in to get a suit fitted and the guys like, this thing isn't laying right. He put an extra like shoulder pad in one shoulder. Like, oh, now it lays right. Your shoulders are uneven. I was like, what? And it's this, you know, the strap where I had, was played Les Pauls for years. And it's like, well, okay, that it'll change your, the guitar playing will change your body. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. But a patch of hair, man, it's like, man, this hurts. Your, your, your body trying to like to pad yourself from, from scraping your skin or something. It's so odd. It's super crazy. I mean, you can, I, I, let's see if I can get it. Uh, I can feel it. Anyway, <laughs> it's real. It's crazy. I'll let nature's you Nature's wristband. <laughs> it is. It's nature's wristband. The When it first started, I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so you so you get back from your mission, you're 21, and you're back in in Southern California. Yeah, and I go back to school, and I and I just um, I start playing in some co oh, some cover bands. Uh huh. Sorry. Uh, and um, I'm like, I'm gonna finish. I, I want to get a degree. Uh, and so I started playing in some just cover bands, nothing serious, really. But we were playing like 80s, 80s covers, and it was super fun. And I started booking the bands that would play at my college. Um, and then I start, I tried to book this band, Sensefield, and which is I, it's just a band I loved. And and then I ended up becoming their touring guitar player. And so I took a little time off from school to go do that in like 2003 when uh, it was kind of like their their last album um because i was trying to book them and then it worked they're like oh no we're in the studio uh and at the end of an email i was just like well cool if you know anyone looking for a guitar player i was in these bands and and let me know or something just such a random like i don't know why i did that it's so like unprofessional if you're just trying to like book but right i was like i was feeling like i want more than this cover band i want to who knows? Maybe they know some people who are in real bands. That would you know, my my dream was to go on tour, right? And you know, I, I leave on my mission. All, only... my, all my friends go on tour, but in that in those few years, right? Because right. I let I quit Death by Stereo. They go on tour with AFI and Good Riddance and and get signed to Epitaph, and I'm like, man, I wish I could have done that, you know, kind of thing. And then yeah, so then Sensefield like they hit me back like hey how good are you so, could you send us a tape or something and I, I was shocked they didn't have like more friends that, that they really knew that they or maybe they tried to reach out and no one could do it or something but I'm just kind of this random dude right and, uh, but I sent them a tape and, and I met up with them like okay cool and, and this I roll in and just learn the songs and did like a six-week U.S. tour and 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 I was like the happiest I've ever been in my life. I was like, yes, I love this. I love every minute of this, you know, and this is what I want to do forever. So something occurred to me a few moments ago, which is that your trajectory is almost the exact opposite of everyone else's or many other people's. In in and what I mean by that is that um you are you you're still studying you're going to school but rock and roll has essentially put you through school and um, kind of yeah and uh uh most people kind of like uh sl slave away at a job where that they don't like i love teaching guitar and when i was teaching guitar i had a cover band gig and 
uh, you know, a bunch of things like that. And it was yeah. great. It was great. It was like, it was tough to schedule. Like you're not probably not as tough as your schedule, but, uh, most people ha you know, are doing some other way less enjoyable job so that they can be in a band. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I got to that point too. I'd done, done that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so yeah i mean this but the school thing held out for a while <laughs> you know and um it's kind of one of those things like since feel like we did this tour it was done it was like they kind of broke up and oh okay now what do i do okay i'll finish my degree i finished my my bachelor's degree i was like oh now what do i do i guess i i guess i just get a job you know and so did some random jobs and like a year later um john bunch the singer of sensefield was singing for a band called further scenes forever and he's like hey we we need a touring we need a touring guy you, you up i'm like yes absolutely <laughs> and you hadn't played music in between those those two gigs no i just i just been working i was you know working at what was it like a scrapbooking supply warehouse and trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And, and then he calls like, okay, yes, let's go. Let's go on tour. And so I'm on tour with them for like a year and they broke up at the end of that. I was like, oh man, okay, well, do I want to go back to working crappy jobs or maybe I'll just, I'll go back to school. And, and then like, if I get a master's degree, I could probably get a better job. And so I start a master's program and then I get a call from the Aquabats, like a couple months, a few months later. Like, hey, do you, we've heard about you some, from a friend of a friend. Do you want to come down and like audition? I was like, sure, why not? And of, of course, like they're from Orange County. I, I'd seen them play. I actually it was in a band that opened for them once when I was like 17. Um, and so obviously I knew who they were. And I was like, this, this could be fun. These guys are, these guys are pretty fun. Um, even though I was mainly playing kind of harder stuff, hardcore right. and then I like, sense field and further were kind of emo post hardcore kind of stuff but i was always open to all kinds of music you know i, I played guitar in the jazz band in high school and basically just so i could play guitar for an hour during school you know? <laughs> but yeah i think you can learn something from every different kind of style of music and i was really open so hey i'll go i'll go jam with the aquabats and and um and they gave me their new record that they just put out and because i wasn't really a big ska fan i listened to this new record i'm like oh wow there's no horns on it this is kind of rad it's kind of new wavy there's a lot of keyboards and i was a big devo fan i was like oh this is this is cool um and then so they're like yeah you want to you want to play with us I'm like yeah absolutely and this was not more not a hired gun but kind of like more member of the band i was like okay awesome but my past experience was like well man these bands that have been around a while could end at any time so right who knows how long this thing with the aquabats will last but let's go for it you know and so i but i, I stayed in my master program i actually didn't take any time off i don't remember taking any semesters off i would just do you know do the homework and the aquabats touring schedule wasn't crazy so you know i could kind of work around it and um and so, yeah, I finished a master's degree while touring with the Aquabats. And then, um, and it was like, okay, now what? Because you know? <laughs> it's like, well, the Aquabats are fun, but they're, we're not making that much money. I like, and I just, what, how can I do this? And then, um, again, started working other jobs. Kind of, you know, the singer of the Aquabats had started this TV show called Yo Gabba Gabba got picked up by Nickelodeon and so I started working on that production and stuff and um and then I was working on that for a while and it's uh pretty laborious I was like man well what if maybe what if I got a PhD because I, I I really enjoy study I just I do it. I love learning I enjoy studying and I'm like well I could become a teacher and I think I'd enjoy that um like a college professor that'd be awesome and um so yeah so then i did you do adjunct work through your studies no not much i, I had done some 
um, the college I went to didn't it didn't really have that built into it like a lot of universities do, where a lot of grad students will teach undergrad classes. It was a strictly graduate university, so there were no undergrad classes to teach. But um, I did do some guest lectures and guest appearances. I was with it was like a it's the Claremont Colleges. It's like a conglomeration of a few schools, and so they there is some people there I, I had to just kind of find opportunities to try and get a little teaching experience and and I did that a little bit but not much um, did you enjoy public speaking from from an early age no no and I still don't really love public speaking but I see teaching differently than public speaking it's more of a controlled thing. environment thing yeah it's it's a little more laid back right it's a smaller audience and you can engage with people Whereas I look at public speaking as, as kind of like politics or, or something where you just get up and you deliver your thing, you know? Right. We're teaching, I, I felt like there was more of an interplay and stuff. I mean, I guess sometimes you have to like present papers at conferences and I, I've done that too, but they still engage at the end of that. Um, but no, I'm not a huge fan of public speaking, but... But being on stage and playing in bands, you get used to being in front of people a little, you know. It's a it's a lot different, especially if they're there to see you. If right. you're the opening <laughs> band and you're trying to address, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You guys ever open for Motorhead? Tough. Yikes! No. Tough. <laughs> um, Aquabats would play with Rancid sometimes. Yeah. We would get nervous. Thinking that they're crowd would crowd. Hate us. <laughs> they, we thought that they would hate us, but it actually went over pretty well. Uh, better than I was than we were expecting. We did like a little tour with them. We we're like, are they gonna hate us? Like, I think nowadays crowds are a little more for, not forgiving. They're a little more open and and you know the, the crowds grew up with iPods and right. and and stuff. So it's like oh, that's sweet if this band is right next to this band that doesn't make any sense musically or they're just maybe nicer crowds nowadays. I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, America is finally sort of blossoming with the uh, festival circuit. Like, I don't remember there being great festivals for decades. Yeah. There was one every once There's in a while. Yeah, there's the warp tour right and um maybe some local small things that happen but yeah the now there's crazy was, big festivals everywhere <laughs> yeah it's incredible very very european but uh the ipod thing is interesting like i think i think you're spot on about that because also someone might only have three songs from one band and not have right. an entire record right I mean, when I was younger, it's probably similar with you, maybe like a lot of your identity got got in or high school or whatever was tied up with the, the music you listen to. And there seemed to be camps, you know, so uh, or tribes or whatever, you know. Right. Oh, he's a metalhead. Oh, he's a punker. Oh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't like that for you. I don't know. But. I mean, I grew up in a very small town. There wasn't a lot of room for cliques there. Yeah. There's like 52 kids in my school. Or my class. Oh, wow. It was wow. very small. Very, very small. One flashing red light. Very small. Okay. Wow. Um, I wanted to ask you about something that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And you mentioned UFOs. Yeah. You mentioned it very casually, but I do a lot of thinking, yeah. and, uh, and not not that I'm have not that I have a lot of like uh, thoughts that haven't been thought plenty of times before. Uh, but I contemplate, you know, what else is out and around a lot. Uh, is there any mention of, like, in your academic study, has there ever been any mention of UFO in lectures? Or is that just, like, in the in the academic world? In academia, is that a laughable thing? 
and that's not in the textbook. So let's not, let's not go there. Um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's not, it's, it's, yeah, it's been mentioned. Um, there's, you know, kind of the, the study of what they call new religious movements, NRMs, and new religious movements are very open to all kinds of beliefs. And the size doesn't really matter. It could be, you know, a few hundred, few thousand people. Um, they formed a group and, and they worship UFOs or space brothers or wh whatever they have a you know quasi-religious group like it, academics study it like on their terms right it's it's like an anthropologist or something you, you go into the tribe in the bush or whatever and, and you study them as they are so they do that for religious movements and and allow people to this is tell what they believe you know um so so yeah there's definitely it's small in in the academy still but like uh new religious movements in in america is includes ufo cults and i hate to use the word cult it's kind of derogatory at least in the academy they try to get away from that um but it's just you know name for a small newer movement right um they all yeah. start somewhere right exactly <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched any of the documentaries that have been out recently? Like the, uh, the one that was in Oregon. I remember when that, you know, being in Washington as a kid, I remember when that was happening. Um, the, uh, what was it? What was it called? They were in Oregon, uh, in the eighties. they tried to poison like they were trying to affect the the it was pretty gnarly they bought oh, a you lot of about the rajneesh yeah the rajneesh yeah 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 what's that one yeah I don't, I don't think they really have that i know of ufo beliefs um no no uh, i i, I kind of shifted gears oh okay yeah yeah no no definitely uh there's a great documentary on them called fears the master that was made maybe in the eighties or nineties. Um, oh, wow. I actually like that more than the more recent Netflix series on them. Really? Uh, I believe it's more even handed than if you watch right. the new, what's the new Netflix series called? Um, I can't think of what it's called, but yeah, there's a, 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 just a couple years old, uh, a mini series on the Rajneeshis. Um, well, we watched it, it last I, year. And I think it was made or funded or something by some of them because it's it's slant, I think it's slanted more to being like these guys were really okay. Um, oh, I didn't really get that impression. I mean, there oh, were really? the... no. Okay, because it was way nicer than this other one that was made. A while. <laughs> uh, that was basically because like yeah, the po the poisoning of the like salad bars at restaurants and stuff at, at that time hell? in the eighties was like the biggest terrorist act on u.s soil to date right so right. um it, it you know people like will quote oh they call him osho uh, uh, rajneesh right and quote him all the time in these inspirational yoga quotes or whatever and and stuff and it's like wow do you know do you know what his followers did in the 80s it was kind of crazy <laughs> <laughs> they kind of took over a town and then when it was time to vote for the leadership, they tried to poison people who could sway the vote against them. It was like, what? But yeah, no, that's a, it's a, that's a crazy story just in American history, right? And like American history and religion, they're intertwined, you know? Right. Um, all, all kind of history and religion are intertwined. Um, Do you watch the yeah, Heaven's that's Gate a, one? That is a crazy documentary or a crazy episode in history. The Heaven's Gate uh, documentary that came out I don't even remember if it was this year or last year. It's been a, it's been a weird couple of years. Sure has. <laughs> uh, that one definitely included UFOs. Well, yeah, because their their beliefs skewed more towards that. You know, they thought they were going to hitch a ride on on the comet. So right. Um, 
I, I don't know if I've seen that most recent one, but I um it's I have some of their like, other ones and I have some of their like training tapes that someone got me. That was it's basically just their leader, the the um app what's his name? Apple White? Apple uh Marshall Applewhite. Yes. Uh or he went by like Bo Peep, I think was his name too, or uh anyway, it's just just basically videos of of him just talking to the camera and stuff and it's with that it's in, it's intense gaze piercing yeah yeah cuckoo yeah. eyes uh yeah that was i i didn't find him to have much charisma to be if i'm if i'm honest i feel like uh i, I feel like uh, the genesis of of religion you would think would come from someone with a lot of charisma and yeah uh, but i think there's also me. the like um there's also the like belonging thing you know sure because there's some some groups where you don't even see the leader that often you know and that's uh and it's the really like the community or certain members of the hierarchy or whatever that kind of bring at least you know with like rajneesh he didn't speak all that often you didn't have as a follower, much access to him. And he'd come out and, and speak every now and then, and then just go back into his, in his house. But, and I don't know how charismatic he, he was, because some of his speeches are just kind of, and you can see on that yeah. series, he, he's stoned or he's on some kind of pills or, or, or what, what not that he's out of it. And like, Maybe earlier on he was more charismatic and was able to gather the core group, but it seems like once you've gathered a core group, you can grow that um, in certain ways, right? Especially the ways they were doing it where it was like, I don't want to say predatory, but they would search after a type of person who yeah. uh, was young, impressionable, usually rich or from a rich family um, that and and was, you know, the incredible the most incredible thing was when they bust in homeless people so that they had uh, stronger voting power increase the numbers yeah but then they realized well we've got it now we've got us like a small city here to contend with and we've got problems we got problems yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> no it's crazy uh, it's crazy. I'm surprised more people don't know about that that uh, episode, you know, in history. It's it's amazing. Do do, uh, do you want to talk about rock and roll? <laughs> sure. I, I mean, sure. I mean, uh, I just am fa I'm fascinated because I feel like I could talk to you for five fucking hours and just ask you questions about things that you've learned in your in your academic studies um because i'm because i'm intrigued by a lot of it um yeah you can you can ask whatever you want man let's well, let's talk about rock and roll yeah let's do it we uh once you finish your once you get your teaching certification yeah how do you see performing and, and rock music being in your life still? Will it be? I don't know. I think it's, it's going to change um, for me personally, you know, and it's like the stage of life I'm in. I have a family and, and kids and, and um, you know, I, I don't see myself touring forever kind of thing. And right. so I'm kind of transitioning to um be more at home you know so I, I see us doing maybe select dates you know that's a that's a great 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 way to say not touring that much anymore right but, um, i don't you know i don't really know i don't really know and i'm, I'm kind of fine with it i don't know last year i kind of made peace with like well i might never tour again and that's okay last year i think but, a lot of people had to because i have to, i have to do something else now because i Cause that, you know, that revenue stream was gone. So I got, I had to figure other stuff out and it's like, well, 
who knows what it's going to come back, what it's going to look like, or for how long it'll come back before something else will happen. It's just, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a little shaky time the next few years, maybe for musicians to, before things get sorted, you know, I don't really know. You mentioned that you have rehearsal tomorrow for a show on Saturday. This will be two days past once this publishes, but have you guys rehearsed? No, we're doing, we're doing, well, we have, we've done it. We did a couple of live streams over the past couple of weeks. Um, so we have had some rehearsal recently and then we're doing a few nights in a row. And then this was our first real live show back um, at the Orange County Fair. So it'll be fun. Um, but uh, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, holy crap, I can't believe I get to do this again. How excited are you? Honestly, I'm or are you nervous? A, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not nervous at all. And I'm, I'm honestly not super excited. It's just, it's like, okay, this is, this is cool, but I got a lot of stuff going on in my life. So it's, I don't want to say it's almost like a hindrance. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I got to play that show. So I got to make time to practice. I got to do that show. Okay. Uh, but I got all this other stuff I got to get done. Um, you know, it's throwing, throwing kids into the mix. It just sure. complicates things a little. So, no, Have I'm very kids... excited to play the show. It's going to be fun. But... Um, Will your kids be there? Yeah, they're all going to come. My oldest daughter has seen us play once, which was the last show we played before lockdown. But my other two uh, daughters have never seen us play. And so they're really excited. Three daughters. Three daughters, yes. Your buddy, you are outnumbered. I am. <laughs> I love it though. I mean, at this point, like, I wouldn't know what to do with a son, I don't think. Right. <laughs> sure. So I, I love I love having girls. Did she did she love seeing you on stage was she confused did you have explained to her like uh i'm i'm gonna wear this costume it's fun it's not scary and it's gonna be loud put these earplugs <laughs> in yeah we've got got the headphones for well um well the aquabats did a, our own tv show um and and so she had had seen episodes of that and kind of understood it a little from that and now my other two daughters have watched it a little too and now they understand it a little as well now and um so i think yeah they're not going to be too scared of it so right it'll be ex it'll be live uh real life television yeah so have they expressed any interest in musical practice they're all really young and I, I have like a little keyboard and guitar in the corner that sometimes they'll mess around with. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be the dad who's like trying to force what I like on them. If they want to learn, that's awesome. We'll find you a teacher. I, I, I don't want them to learn from me. Um, you know, I, I feel like they, you would, you would just learn better from someone who isn't your dad, you know? Right. Um, so I, I'd love if they wanted to learn. If not, that's, that's fine. You know, I know that they love music. Like we, there's a lot of music in the house, you know, and they love dancing and singing and, and stuff. So um, I want, I'd love to instill a love of music in them. You know, um, they want to learn an instrument. That's cool. You know, I hope they want to. We'll see. My oldest daughter is more like physical, man. She's into gymnastics and, and ballet and, and stuff like that so uh and swimming so whatever they want to learn i want to you know help them roll with that yeah of course of course uh are, so you're at a music school yes are you teaching in person I, I see that you have a computer are you also teaching online um it's mainly in person here at the school and then sometimes uh well, like the past year, I was also doing Zoom lessons through the Aquabats website. Oh. Um, 
And so if they were young kids, I would put on the full costume and you'd have a lesson with eagle bones, you know? And so it, it seems like it made a lot of kids happy during a weird time, you know? Right. Uh, so that, that was pretty fun. Um, oh, that's awesome. But, yeah, scaled, scaled back on those. But yeah, this is like in person, which I think is the best kind of instruction you can get. And, um, and this, this is like an, like an independent rock school and they have really good staff here and, and facilities and it's more like it's almost more like mentoring too like oh you want to do this for real okay we'll teach you how i'll teach you how i'll touch, show you how to build a pedal board how to <laughs> how to pack for tour or you know right or like oh you're into this gear let's well let's look at this you know let's i'll, I'll bring in all my pedals you can you can have a whole lesson where you just pick pick your pe pick all these pedals out and see what you like you know and so um it's more than just guitar lessons to me it's, it's it's you know music appreciation and it's it's real world experience too and they'll have these groups and at the, the end of a, a a season they'll go play a live show at a house of blues or something you know oh that's and awesome. some, of these, some of these kids like i'm like wow these are better than opening bands we've had open for us you know <laughs> <laughs> i know that one so um yeah there's you know it, it, it's a lot of fun what and is I've taught the... lessons off and on privately, you know, for a decade or more. So I've always liked, liked to teach lessons. I think it's great. I mean, yeah. I, anytime you can have a guitar in your hands and also help, help someone make a connection with music, I think it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. What's the... <sighs> What's the mask and COVID situation where you're at and where uh, I know that you're not a science tist, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you go outside, you can read people you've been around. Like, like what are the, what are the, like the mandates or what are people doing? Oh, I don't, I mean, the mandates are the, I mean, uh, what what's the vibe and where do you insane. what do you think i think they just like remandated masks uh in california oh but no one seems to be really enforcing it like businesses it's what it seems like now it's like almost like 50 50 some people are wearing it some people aren't and everyone's at least in person seeming to be cool with that um Right. So I haven't seen anyone like getting in anyone's face for wearing or not wearing. It, it's not pretty sketchy for a while. Yeah. It's, it's a, divis it's a divisive thing. <laughs> People are real upset about it. Sure. <laughs> and I, yeah, I don't know what to, what to say about this. It's a, uh, we could do the whole a whole five hours on this. I know, I know. It's been a really. But I don't difficult... think I want to. <laughs> no, me neither. Um, so, through COVID, were you able to continue your studies online? Um, yes. So my PhD, um, basically last summer. I went to a cabin in the woods and wrote half my dissertation last summer for like a month. My wife was just like, all right, just go. I got this. We're good. Just, just go get it done. And, um, that's incredible. My parents, yeah. My parents have a little, a little like condo in Utah in the middle of nowhere. And so I just, I just went up there and, um, wrote, researched read wrote did interviews and stuff and and wrote like half my dissertation which was awesome um so yeah i i, I have gotten some work done during covid so <laughs> i imagine it's pretty, it's, free, it's pretty free form at this point and if you were talking about the phd like after coursework is done you're kind of on your own right uh, there's like two years of coursework uh and then uh, and then you have to do the qualifying exams and then the dissertation. And I, I did the qual I finished the qualifying exams. Gosh, I guess it's been like three, 
three years ago or so. Um, and to me, I think that was maybe the hardest part studying for those, but, um, but yeah, like after coursework, you're kind of, you're kind of on your own and not on your own totally, but you don't have to be in class sessions or stuff. And so maybe I'm wrong, but having three young kids being, being home a lot in the last year and a half probably wasn't an incredible, like incredibly different yes no yeah i mean no yeah <laughs> I, 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 I tell you like that like covid didn't really change anything for us we have three little kids there's we weren't going anywhere anyway right yeah it didn't <laughs> we were we had nowhere we could go really so yeah because we had we just had our, our our third uh in 2019 so um so yeah we were we basically we had three kids in like three and a half years essentially wow 2015 17 19 and uh we're done uh but uh but yeah so we we just have three little kids we weren't going out to dinner we weren't going to the movies like (laughs) yeah covid wasn't that different i just you know had to put on a mask when i go to the grocery store basically (laughs) <laughs> I, you know when i go there at night by myself when the kids are asleep so it, it's so easier <laughs> uh surely there's some sort of a an uh, like a um an aquabats mask thing joke to you could have <laughs> yeah up, probably but... uh we've been, we've been wearing masks for years <laughs> What did you guys, I mean, did you guys implement anything at home to keep everyone extra safe? I mean, I guess the youngest, your youngest daughter uh, didn't know any different anyway, probably. Yeah, my my hope was kind of like, this would blow over in enough time for them not to really remember it. (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh, well, they're still pretty young. Maybe if this blows over pretty quickly like it'll just be this weird blip in their memory or maybe they won't even remember it at all you know um that was kind of my hope you know but we'll see we'll see how it goes you you think that ship has sailed yeah i don't i don't think it's going away anytime soon right um so yeah Uh, the idea of you not getting to play music is makes me a little sad. But surely, <laughs> surely there you'll find ways to do to do music if you're not. Yeah, yeah. No, I think like um, I think being a teacher is actually a pretty decent job to have as a musician. Sure. Who, is, who isn't a full time musician because you get the summers off and uh, that's usually when the most tours happen. So hopefully, yeah, maybe I'll be touring in the summer, the summers, you know, and then do some festivals on weekends or some local dates on weekends. Who knows? You said uh, high school, you want to teach high school. Yeah. Let's face it. Those are the toughest crowds on earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, maybe. Yeah. I, and I've, I've substitute taught at high schools. Oh yeah, before, and I actually enjoyed it. Um, so, but yeah, maybe you did sub. You did some substitute teaching. That's yes. and those are yeah. random, like you get the call in the morning kind of deal. No, I was just I was a long term substitute at a at a private school where you don't need a teaching right. credential, um, and it was like a long term sub. So I was like six months just at this at this one school and it was great what subjects were you teaching it was uh geography and um history and economics economics was a little shaky for me (laughs) oh you know we watched a lot of shark tank uh... (laughs) did you really yeah but because you know honestly that show i thought was really good in describing how business works and how and money works and and um 
a lot of the students were English language learners and there was a, a cultural gap there. So um, I thought it, it was, it was uh, interesting for them to see, you know, how, how the economy works here and stuff. A lot of them were um, students from China and other places that would come over here for their ed high school education. So, um, so yeah, no, I thought actually Shark Tank was like real world stuff they could actually understand. And, right. and it's kind of fun because there's these wacky products and, <laughs> and, but you can, you know, it's like negotiation is a real world life skill that I think everyone has to hone throughout their lives. And um, being able to learn kind of the art of negotiating is, is a skill beyond just the classroom, right? Did you ever answer my question about uh, whether you had a favorite era of history to study? Oh, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I did. Um, Do you? One that you're era. most sort of fascinated or where, that you've done your most amount of study on? Um, always fascinated by ancient Egypt since I was a kid. That's like one of those and what I like every kid probably, you know, I saw a National Geographic with the King Tut, you know, sarcophagus on. I'm like, what is going on there? Incredible, right? You know, so that, so like ancient history, like I was really, in, I was a nerd. I was into like um, ancient Greece and all the Greek gods and mythology and stuff. So there's something about ancient history I like that it's, there's something mystical about it so far back in the, mists of time that like what, what was real what was I don't know you know it could have been this it could have been that you know and now I'm talking like I'm on an episode of ancient aliens but um you know who knows it's so far who, back who doesn't love that show though yeah <laughs> right <laughs> I mean come on what's not to love yeah it, it, whether you even go for it or not it's super yeah, entertaining. Exactly. But also, uh, uh, they have as they, you know, whatever there it's entertainment and exactly. yeah. Uh, what it's edutainment. Yeah. Infotainment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I was in grade school in the Bay area when, um, the first King Tut exhibit toured the States. Oh, wow. And uh, it came to San Francisco, which was a BART train right away. Awesome. And, you know, my my class had a contest, you know, like whatever, uh, two students were going to get to go with the teacher. And, uh, you know, whatever, I don't even remember, writing, a, writing the paper, I won the paper writing thing. And, uh, and then, uh, I, I just didn't get to go. Which oh, is, <laughs> I still have never seen it. Have you seen it in person? No, not the, not the main one. I, I've seen, uh, it was kind of like a bait and switch at this, this museum. It's like, we've got King Tut artifacts and they've got like the sarcophagus on the front. I'm like, rad. I go there and they don't have the real one. They've got like a smaller little one that looks kind of like it. And the other like other f artifacts from his tomb, but they don't have the main one. And like I get it, that, like if I was Egypt, I wouldn't let that thing out of my sight. It was the um, traveler sar sarcophagus. Yeah, it was the traveler model. Maybe they had like a replica in there, but they yeah they had a real. It was a smaller one. It wasn't it wasn't him, but it was in his 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 tomb. It was kind of is I felt kind of gypped a little. Have you been to Egypt? No, man, that's like, that's bucket list. I wish uh, I'd love to. What's the farthest tour you've been on? Um, when I was playing for Gerard Way, his solo album, um, we did like a month across Asia. It was like, um, started in Ukraine, went all across Russia and ended in China. So it was like, but it was, it was crazy. Like who does a month in Russia? Like we were on the Trans-Siberian Railway. We played in Siberia. We played like all, all across the, that whole continent. It was nuts. 
So that's probably the farthest I've been. When, What's that? When was this? This was 2015. How incredible was that? Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Wait a minute. You said 2015? Mm-hmm. Was your wife pregnant while you were gone? Yes. How pregnant was she? Um, we had my daughter in December. I think this was, oh, I'm trying to remember, this was maybe August. So she was... Middle section. Yeah, maybe five or six months. I'm, trying, I'm bad at math. <laughs> did you actually were you actually on the train yeah well there's a couple sometimes we'd like take little tiny planes like fly to do because the shows are really spread apart but there's a couple times we did like sleeper cars on on the trains and then one of them was like the trans-siberian railway you know had you been <laughs> to russia before or to china um i'd only been to russia we did two shows in Russia earlier that year at the end of a European tour with Gerard Way and they were huge and that was like oh we got to come back soon and um because I guess I don't I don't know if My Chemical Romance ever really played there or maybe they played a couple shows there but they hadn't really hit there yet and in a few years they like they had caught up and they oh yeah and so they when, when you did the Gerard Way solo stuff they were really big shows and uh but then what was the crazy thing which is like how unstable their economy was is like we came back like six months i think we played there in like february it's like two really big shows like saint petersburg and moscow we come back six months later and like the shows didn't sell very well because the economy had tipped and within six months like everyone like i don't know the, the ins and outs of it but everyone was broke and and uh, no one could afford to go to shows. So there's still a decent amount of people, but not, I think, what their promoters were expecting. Right. But um, I didn't care. I love playing to, to small crowds. It's so much fun. And, and I got to see the entire continent of Russia. <laughs> it was nuts. Yeah. What was the what was the most interesting thing that you experienced there? Um, that's a long time to spend. It's a big, big country. Yeah. Um, I did have a, a funny experience. Uh, there was like a, a, a like an aerospace cosmonaut kind of museum right right by one of our venues or hotels, and it's like, oh, rad! Like Russians are really into space and rockets. I want to go check this out. So me and the and the bass player went over there and um, we're looking at, it's a really small museum, but they had like a, a full rocket like outside of it. Like one of like decommissioned rock, you know, right. space rocket. So it was like, oh wow, this is gonna be awesome. But you got in and, the, and this museum was actually pretty small. They had an exhibit about ancient aliens in it, which I thought was funny, but, mm -hmm. um, but we're going through and there's like models of rockets and like the curator, whoever, we were the only people in there. The curator comes over to us, could tell we were American. And he's like, this one, this one was going to send the bomb. I was like, oh, okay. I guess we got, we got to be going now. Like, this is the rocket that we were going to send the bomb to blow up America. This, this is just so you know. This is the rocket here that was going to carry the bomb to blow you guys up. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. I get the sense they had more than one. No, I know, but I, <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure they did. Either but that or. Crazy. As you move more uh, east in the country, the more it got like you were going back in time and the, like the more relics of communism and stuff you would see like more like tanks and stuff in the town or like kind right. of the, the the um the crazy uh communist art on buildings and statues and stuff the more west it was like st petersburg was very kind of like oh this is like europe you know right it felt a lot like europe um 
but then as you, as you moved east it just kept getting more and more like back in time kind of it felt like to me <laughs> crazy yeah. uh and everyone been... like it was amazing because not too many bands go there and the kids were just so stoked and the and the crowds were awesome and yeah it, it was great i've been listening to a podcast called dictators mm -hmm. and it's pretty broad stroke education on the on dictators throughout time uh but it's it's crazy yeah and Poli uh, politics I just think are a nuisance yeah I'm not a fan of politics man I, I hate politics. <laughs> it's a real nuisance my whole life I've hated politics and it you know what, like last year is like it forced me to have to pay attention to it but um but yeah my whole life I'm just I just I want to rock and and read about weird stuff and that's I don't I don't need to bother with all the politics it's so much energy that I think for me I, I could I don't like expending in that direction I think there's a lot of other stuff that's more fruitful so and that and that matter more in our day-to-day -day lives and exactly. and beyond that exactly hmm. yep um what about China? I know that you have to go soon. It was uh, it was only one show, and it was a festival, um, and uh, it was pretty intense because uh, the you know driving just from the airport to our hotel, you look down streets and you and in the there'd be like lines of military like doing. Uh, uh, what you, exercises and stuff and um and then i so after after our show i convinced like one of the like one of our like handlers like take me into the town take take me into beijing let's show me the show me some crazy stuff you know he took me to an american sports bar <laughs> is that right <laughs> yeah it was like me and a couple other guys like yeah we're gonna go i want to i want to see some mogwais let's go find the weird you know back alleys i wanted to see some real deal china you know and it, it, they took us to a sports bar i was like no <laughs> they just didn't get it they, they, they thought like, like... oh they, they'll want to eat some american food here you know this is, you know and i was like no no i want to I want to see the real stuff, you know, but it was kind how, of funny. How were the onion rings? Uh, I think I had like, t like tater skins or, or something, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> played some darts and I was like, no, this is not what I wanted. Um, but no, it was, it was cool. Uh, and um, again, like a rad crowd of people who are stoked. About on live music. music. Yeah. Which, again, can just break down barriers, you know? I think anything that breaks down barriers and is is not divisive is good. Yeah. Um, I've always thought that, and I always will think that. Absolutely. Tell you, if it keeps raining here... Uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to have to build an ark. Are you you're in upstate New York, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's been That's a beautiful area. I love it up here. Have you have you played over here in Troy or Albany? I've played Albany and and like Buffalo and Rochester, but never Troy. Albany is like we're very close to Albany. Okay. If you come back out this way, let me know. Yeah, we'll see. It's very hopefully close. one day. <laughs> right. Well, we won't talk about uh, the episode, the uh, the video, the song that that we worked on together. But I believe, okay. I believe that our singer will be delivering next week. There, this person was supposed to sing on Saturday, but the but in Seattle, there's a heat wave is coming. It's going to be a hundred degrees. And uh, my guy Don 
it's gonna it's just gonna be too hot in his studio to work. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't next week he gets air conditioning. Oh, there you go. Nice. That's where we're at. You have to have air conditioning in Seattle now. <laughs> that that's crazy. That blows my mind. It's uh, that's real. It's like a hundred degrees there now. I think. Wow. It's real hot here, buddy. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's hotter. A, little, a little hotter here, but I'm close to the beach, and it kind of stays kind of even most of the time. You know. When the fires happened last year, did you guys get smoke or did the coast sort of help you out? Uh, we got a little, yeah. 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 Can I ask you a question? Sure. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Because we've because we've just sort of grazed the UFO thing, we've grazed the the spaceship thing. There's a lot of talk People talk about stuff off the coast of Southern California. Uh, have you ever seen anything weird out there over the water? No, I haven't. The, no, not really. No, no. That, I mean, yeah, this, it's kind of a hot spot out here. Um, some people say like off of Malibu, there's like an underground UFO base or something. You can see it on Google Maps. There's this weird obviously not natural formation right off the coast really? um yeah that's around malibu kind of right like right off the coast um don't you think people... that it would be i mean don't you think that that would be a terrible place to put something underwater like uh, well i mean i guess it depends on who you're talking about like who put it there and when did they put it there like, I, I don't know. The, this is getting interesting. <laughs> it depends on what you think UFOs are. And, right. And, 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 and who's moving them around and stuff. So, I, you know, I don't know. There's a hot spot down kind of off of uh, like Baja, California, actually Mexico, you know? Yeah. There's an island out there that they have a lot of UFO sightings. Down in San Diego, San Diego seems to be a hot spot as well. But there's a lot of military as well around there. I swear I saw a UFO. Seems to, seems to correlate. Oh, really? Where? In Seattle, which is crazy. Uh -huh. And uh, I was on my motorcycle riding home from a show. And I pulled up at a stoplight. It was in the industrial area along the river, the Duwamish River that runs through South Seattle. And uh, I looked over and I saw it. I mean, it was 50 feet above the river, on above the water. And my motorcycle was is loud. But if it was a helicopter... It would have been louder than my motorcycle right. and a car pulled up next to me and I was still dumbfounded looking at it. And I looked over at them and they said, did you fucking see that? And uh, I said, yes, I did. And I, and uh, without hesitating, I just blew the red light and I, I started following the, the river route, you know, the, the road to go up towards like the ferry terminal and that. But it, I mean, it was just like, it was fast and it was gone. And it okay, was so I'm going to ask, is it just hovering or did it move? Like... No, it moved, but it didn't move, you know, lightning. It didn't move like these things that you see. Yeah, yeah it didn't move that, it, but it was smooth and quiet. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and, and it illuminated. Okay, how how um, was it saucer shaped? I couldn't. I mean, it was dark. I, yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like this, is like a some light. I mean, it could have been a drone that we that me and four people in the car next to me misinterpreted its size because yeah. of the light. You know, whatever. Like sometimes the lack of light. You can't distinguish distance, but first, I mean, 
It wasn't like anything I'd seen before. Yeah. And maybe it was a drone. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like a weird thing to be flying at night. Um, yeah, over a population. Um. It uh, but pretty weird. Yeah. Pretty weird. Now, I've seen stuff like I'll look in the sky and I'll see a plane, like a it looks like a passenger airplane, right? And and I'll look back and it'll be gone, you know, something like that. Right. And I'm like, well, did it just go behind a cloud? It's like a silver kind of cigar, but that's, but that's like what a plane looks like when you're looking at it, right? Uh, from a certain it angle. Turned into a star. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never. I, that's amazing. I've never had the like. This is a. I've seen a UFO. I don't. I've never had that. I've seen the like, sky turn green once, like a green light lit up a sky once, but I don't know what that was either. It could have been right. weather. What? I, but I've never seen a UFO that I would call a UFO. Yeah, I don't know what that thing was that I saw, but it, I could call it a UFO. Sure, call it a UFO. I couldn't identify it, but I'm also not, uh, you know, I don't work in a tower at the airport or I'm not an air yeah. traffic control or or a, I don't work for the Air Force. I don't have a GS rating, <laughs> you know? That, but that, I think that doesn't matter, I don't no. think. I mean, like, people like to trust the testimonies of of military or cops or people who are trained to observe right but um right. that doesn't discount to me that doesn't discount average person's testimony you know? it also doesn't lend a hundred percent credibility to theirs sure yeah right sure. i have this secret hope i've talked about it on the podcast here a couple times that i i really hope that ufos are us but time traveling us oh yeah that's a that's a solid theory time travelers from the future us trying yeah. to unscrew things <laughs> and it would be easy yeah, i mean maybe do. like a lot of the ufos they'll go to like nuclear installations and disarm the warheads like that's documented it would be easy enough for us to do because we're us Sure. We just, we just eventually have to be smart enough or clever enough to be able to do that. Which, right. who who knows? What do I know? I'm just a simple man uh, with a podcast and a guitar. And no, I mean, dude, I, I've gone way, way deep on the UFO thing. Um, so many documentaries and books and there's so many there's so many angles you know off world interdimensional us from the future secret government programs like it could be one or all or none of all of those theories right i mean could be all of them right who's to say it's, it's it's just one monolithic oh it's just people from other planets kind of it it's like i honestly i think it's a high percentage of the sightings since the 50s at least have been us from now it's black budget military stuff that even the president doesn't president doesn't know about just kind of off the books stuff that we're testing and people happen to see um but that's that's where that's where i lean I'm not saying that there haven't been people from other planets or interdimensionals or whatever, but I think the highest percentage of sightings are probably craft that we've made now. Did we make it just from our own volition? Did we find down craft? Did we piggyback on German technology or whatever? So there's a lot of theories as to if, if it's us, where did we get the tech, you know? What do you think about know. this? I believe, even though I, I believe in the power of, of prayer and meditation and energy. Yeah. And the human imagination is similarly powerful. And a lot of things that we imagine come to pass. Things that seemed 
insanely impossible, right? Yeah. So, isn't it possible that, I mean, do, do UFO and alien movies predate the Roswell stuff? Like stories and all that? Did it, did it predate? Do you know? Uh, yes. So, um, see, yeah. And, and now we have flying machines. We have, everyone's got a computer in their pockets, like Star Trek style. These are things that we've imagined. I think we need to stop making zombie movies or we're going to be screwed. Cause <laughs> we imagined it, man. Right. Be care it's careful what you wish for, right? Careful what you think. <laughs> What do you what you put out there? It'll return to you. I believe it. Yeah, I really do. So listen, kids, cut it out with the zombie movies, the vampire movies, <laughs> the doomsday, the two thousand twelves, all that stuff. Right. I, don't, I do not aspire <laughs> with that. The apocalypse movies. I'm not into. I mean, I'm totally into them, <laughs> but I'm not into living during that period. Same, same. <laughs> it sounds terrible. It sounds oh, yeah. terrible. No, it's yeah. <laughs> uh, you you've got someone coming in in one minute. I do. Okay. Uh, you know what? You're great. Hey, so are you. This was a lot of fun. You're great. I'm glad. I'm glad that you you carved out some time this evening, and we were no, able to I'm make it happen. To. Uh, I'm super stoked to have had the chance to speak with you and i'm really we'll do it another excited time and we'll talk about rock and roll why not <laughs> why not i would love to hear more stories about uh russia because yeah. we, in my podcast study <laughs> they covered a number of you know of of people who formerly ruled that place right Man, they've they've had a real run. Oh yeah, they, absolutely. They have quite a history. Um, absolutely. Have a great night. Do you have any? Uh, I I'm guessing you have some great photos of yourself on the stage. Yes. Yeah, I have a few. Would yeah. you share uh, a few with me that I can cut up into some episodes? Yes. Or uh, yeah, into yeah, some sure. uh, thumbnails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Have a great lesson. Yeah, we'll do, man. I'm glad we got to connect. Have a great re uh, rehearsal tomorrow, and and, uh, and I hope you have a great show. Thank I you. Hope yeah. It'll be fun. All right. We're playing with the uh, the English beat. Oh, killer! I just found out that we're headlining for some reason, and I and I was like, no, wait, what? But um. I'm stoked. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm just, it's weird. It's like, I'm just stoked. I just want to play some my, for my kids. I think right. my kids will be stoked to see me. And uh, so that'll be fun. Oh, that's amazing. Well, yeah. have have fun. All right. Thanks, man. I can't yeah. wait to hear the song too. It's It sounds great. Awesome. All right. Have a great night. All right. Take care, Mike. Bye. Bye.